Don't you want to get a massage or do something fun? It's a bit, 40's huge. I'm turning 38. Okay, 38. We will move on. Isn't it weird that our birthday is the same week and then we're gonna have a party and it's just for me? No, I don't think it's weird at all. Cause you're turning 40 and I'm turning 38. Come on, do you really want to be one of those ladies who's just so insecure about their age and they lie and then they gotta forget, then they gotta remember and it gets all- You don't get it. So you don't understand how it works. I don't want to shop at old lady stores. I don't want to go to J. Jill and Chico's and Ann Taylor Loft. I'm not ready yet. I need two more years. That is so insane, it kind of makes sense. What did you get me for my birthday? Wait a minute, I thought you said that we shouldn't get each other gifts this year. What do you mean? You're supposed to get me a surprise gift. This is a big birthday. I'm turning 40. That was a clip from This Is 40. I'm delighted to be joined by its director, Judd Apatow. Hello, Judd, how are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, it's good to have you on the show. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Tell us about This Is 40. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, would you, is it a sequel to, to Knocked Up? Is it a sort of sequel? Is it a spin-off? How would you call it? I guess it's kind of a spin-off. It's like there was Cheers, then there was Frasier. You know, it's, yes. uh, there was, there was a Forgetting Sarah Marshall, and then we spun off Russell Brandon to get him to the Greek. So, you know, I like the idea of, you know, making a movie... Uh, with a character from one movie, did like you know, following them and going, what's going on in their world, and just following them home. So uh, you know, it's a way for me to talk about, you know, not just middle age, but also just about a family trying to figure out how to do everything right, and the more they obsess over it and try to control it, everything kind of goes wrong. Okay, so this is Pete. This is Pete and Debbie. Tell us just a bit more about them. So, we, we, so we learned what from them previously, and where do we find them now? In this is forty. Well, it knocked up, you know, Seth Rogen and Katherine Heigl, you know, got pregnant as, as the result of a one night stand. And Debbie uh, was uh, Katherine Heigl's sister, uh, played by Leslie Mann. And she, she was married to Paul Rudd. And they were kind of, you know, the ghosts of Christmas future. And so they, they, they would watch this squabbling couple and it made them more scared as they were about to have this baby they didn't plan to have. Uh, and people really responded a lot to it because... It, it, it was about how hard it is to get along when you live with someone for decades. You know, a lot of times my, my daughter will say, why do, you, why do you you fight with mommy? And I say, imagine spending every second of your life with the same person. Imagine <laughs> spending every second of your life with your best friend. How many times would you fight them? How many times would you be really mad at them? And, uh, you know, that, especially when you bring wounds into your relationship and you project all your problems onto them, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. You know, it's hard to admit you're wrong. It's hard to change for another person. It's so much easier to try to get them to change to, just to make you feel better. So <laughs> This is 40 is about, you know, the week they both turn 40 and you know, all their problems kind of come out. Except she thinks she's 38. Well, she's trying to hold on to 38 <laughs> as best she can. She wants two more years. This is this is um, uh, this is a very funny film. It's a painful film, Judd, as you as you well know. I mean, a lot of people are going to go and sit, go to this film and and laugh and squirm in equal measure. Uh, yeah, I like that. I mean, it's supposed to be a you know, it is a drama with a lot of comedy, and there's a little bit of a an independent film feeling to it. There's something experimental about it because it's very very funny, but it's truthful and it doesn't shy away from the uh, more painful corners of trying to get along with somebody. But there's also a romance in the fact that, you know, they, they're always going to figure out how to solve the problem. No matter how much they fight and how bad the fight is, they're going to get through it together. The, uh, the family that we're talking about, uh, Judd, is, is, is essentially your family. I mean, that's why, it, obviously, there's an autobiographical element to lots of your stuff, but this feels particularly so uh, with, your, with your wife and kids, as, as you know, taking the, taking the starring roles. Uh, yes, and I, I, I felt like that's something people don't do in movies. So oh, it's, it's true, uh, it's true. <laughs> it's somewhat reckless. There's a good reason for that, good reason for that. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a little crazy. Now that the movie's done and people like it, I can look back and go, what was I thinking? That's insane. Uh, you know, we're not the Jacksons. What are we doing? But <laughs> not yet. I, but but I, th I, th I thought it would be interesting to see people who really love each other on screen, to see the intimacy of 
the relationship between Leslie and her children and between my daughters with each other and their rivalry and their anger. And they've known Paul for so long that he fits right in. And a lot of the movie is also about a man who lives with three women and yeah. how sometimes you feel like an outcast in your own house. So it actually helps in a weird way that he's not related to them. And they're really funny. And so when you, when you know people intimately, you can show things that no one would know to show. And I feel like it's uh, the movie's filled with performances that are somewhat unprecedented because the line between a documentary and a fiction is so blurred. Well, it's, it, you know, and, and it's, as, as any parent will, will admit, it's difficult enough just to sort of get along and get your kids to do stuff that you want them to do, like tidy their room or clear up after them, or wash up or that kind of stuff. But to direct your kids in a movie, which is all about relationships with their parents, what was that like? You know, that was the, the best part because I just find my kids so funny and you know, something that I enjoy is trying to figure out how to help people's thing come across. So when I meet Steve Carell and we're, we're trying to figure out how do you make a movie where Steve Carell's the lead? You know, he's never been the lead in a movie. How do you make Kristen Wiig the lead of a movie? And, you know, Cracking that code is fun, and and I have to say it's it was fun to do, uh, you know, with my daughters. They're so interesting. How do I capture it in the movie? You know, they're really funny, but they're vicious to each other sometimes, and it's somewhat heartbreaking when they don't get along. And it, it is trying to catch uh, lightning in a bottle. Do they take and direction from their father? They do because uh, they've watched it. And I think for them, it's fun to try to jump into something they've been watching their whole lives. They've had little parts and knocked up and funny people. So they've been on sets and that wasn't scary. It's really about getting them so relaxed that they just behave. And they know what's funny, too. It's not just uh, them being themselves. They both have an awareness of where the jokes are and how to hit a punchline and you know, I'm kind of like a soccer mom, you know, uh, instead of being excited when they score a goal, I'm excited when they hit a punchline. And, and, and are they playing exaggerated versions of themselves or do more than Iris, do they just, uh, is that just them or are they playing, playing different characters? How, about, how does that work? I think out? that they're actually playing less uh, exaggerated versions of themselves. I think they're worse than they, in real life than they are in the movie. They fight more, <laughs> they're meaner. They're, they might even be funnier because they're so awful to each other sometimes. Hey, that was my stomach. I knew the hey, mic was too close to my belly. There you go. It's, the, it's your last interview before lunch. It's always it's either we can either blame it on the London Underground system or we can just say it's you know it's it, it's hunger. You know, and you you have to use these things. You know, there was a scene in the movie where Leslie and Paul were talking, and they're talking about how often they have sex, and Paul gets mad, and so he farts, and that wasn't in the script. It was just something that. Oh, he actually does. Paul, uh, he, he does for real. It's not even like faked. I mean, he, and it, I didn't ask him to do it. <laughs> but Leslie knows to just go with it. So she starts yelling at him and, and saying, you know, this is why we never have sex. You know, the mystery is gone. And, and you know, it's so disgusting. And, and of course, then he farts again. Uh, but, but that's our, our process, which is, you know, we try to, you know, make it as alive as possible. And that became one of the funniest movies, parts of the movie. It, you know, it seems just kind of gross, but also it was, it was very hostile. It was a hostile gas. So, so this, because I did, of course, assume that this is something that's added in afterwards. But you, so this is, so when people say that this is, this, I don't know, is it the first, uh, maybe it's the first live fart in, 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 in movie history? I may get a special Academy Award for that. <laughs> Uh, but it, it just go to show you that when you tell the actors, you know, we're going to do the script, but if you ever think of anything, just go for it. You don't have to ask permission. Uh, you know, you get a moment like that. And because Leslie's so mad at him when he does it, that the look in her face is something that I don't think someone could even act. <laughs> I don't think Daniel Day Lewis could pull that off. And he played Lincoln. <laughs> Um, so is that, is that an example then of one of your sort of fabled long takes, you know, when you, ju when you just, you just, you just keep filming and see what happens. Yeah. Every once in a while, you know, there's a scene and you realize that, you know, you could write it all day long, but something else is going to happen on the day. You know, there's a sequence where Jason Siegel and Chris O'Dowd are hitting on Megan Fox. And I wrote a lot of jokes for it, but I knew on the day I'm just going to roll film for an hour and a half 
and just let them hit on her and see what happens. And, uh, you know, it's one of the funniest scenes in, in the movie. But for the most part, most of our improvisations happen in rehearsals where we play around and I take notes and then I, I try to use what's good and polish it up and put it into the script. And then on the day, I'll remember a bunch of other things they said and I'll feed that to the actors during the takes. So you're, you're essentially, you're heckling. You're heckling your own cast. Yeah, I, that is part of the process, which is there are certain takes where as they're acting, I'll just keep yelling out different ideas and different lines for both of them uh, or just even directions for them to improvise in. And, you know, sometimes something really great comes out of that. Sometimes sometimes nothing. It's, uh, you know, it all depends on the day. But I like when something other happens, when the actors surprise each other because they're so in the moment. We need to talk about the music, Judd, uh, in this movie, because uh, Paul Rudd character uh, is he's got a record label. And uh, and I think this is this is, of course, a great fantasy, you know, of every every guy wants to have their own record label. And tell us what what his uh, what his brief is. It's a particular type of record company that he's got. Well, he has a, a retro label. So he puts out all his favorite artists from the 70s and 80s who are still making new albums. And so his feeling is that the the bar is very low. He doesn't have to sell a lot of records to be successful, but he's not even selling that many records. And the new album he's going to put out is a reunion record of Graham Parker and The Rumor, who haven't had a record in 30 years. So, you know, I, I called Graham Parker and asked him, you know, if he would play this part in this movie. And a lot of the joke is that Graham Parker isn't selling many records anymore. And he, he's hoping that this new reunion record will change that. So a lot of the jokes are making fun of his career. So I needed someone who's a great artist, but also can, you know, satirize what's happened in the music industry, because most people don't sell a lot of records. If you're not like Rihanna or something, you're probably not selling many records. Uh, and he was hysterical. And as a result of how funny he is in the movie and how great his his band sounds, they went on this big tour of America and sold out everywhere really? and they have a new album <laughs> and the new album did great. And, and so by, you know, being on himself, he's hot again. You know, he just email, emailed me. He's like, I'm on Jimmy Fallon show on Thursday. Check it out. So he's uh, he's back. So uh, that's it was the best possible outcome. Yes. So had you always, always been a Graham Parker fan? Because, you know, there was a, it's a real surprise. You go, of course, it's, it's great to have him here. And, and he was big in the late 70s. You go, oh, right, they're, you know, they're still alive then. Yeah, he's, uh, he's fantastic. I, I've, I've loved his music forever. And I've bought his albums, uh, you know, for the last 30 years. And, it, you know, the record that he put out three years ago that almost nobody bought is as good as all the old records. But I think that happens to a lot of these artists, which is, you know, you're not part of the culture in the same way you were when you know, a certain type of music first hit. And then you're just an artist. You're just expressing yourself and you're telling your stories. And And I love these guys who don't care uh, to change, to try to win everybody over. Uh, it, Loudon Wainwright's the same way. He scored Knocked Up with Joe Henry and he just makes these beautiful personal records. And every once in a while, for some reason, people buy them. Sometimes they don't, but he doesn't care. He's just going to keep expressing himself. And uh, and also, just while we're, while we're talking music, Ryan Adams comes on. What a fantastic song he's playing for you. Uh, yes, Ryan Adams is in the movie. And, and a lot of great people contributed songs. There's a, a whole sequence uh, to a Fiona Apple song that she wrote just for the movie. And Lindsey Buckingham wrote a song for the movie. Nora Jones. There's a Wilco song at the end of the movie. It, it, there's a great soundtrack coming out with a lot of uh, brand new music, which I've never done before. I've never asked people to write songs for one of my films, because I've always been nervous about having to reject it if I didn't like it. You, know, you don't want to you know, ask someone <laughs> to write you a song and, they, and then say, oh, by the way, I hate your song and I'm not using it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but this time I, I, I went for it. Uh, just going back to the, to, the, to the heart of the movie, which is you know, the relationship between Paul Rudd and, uh, and, and your wife and your kids, which always strikes me as, you know, this is a very strange thing going on. But there's one big set piece argument, which I wonder is the one which most parents will go, yeah, OK, we've had a variation of that. It's the one where uh, you're taking away the Wi-Fi, you're taking away the computers and you're trying to eat healthy food and whatever it was that started that whole thing going. And, and your elder daughter particularly is incandescent. 
uh, that you could have done such a thing. I, I just thought that, yes, there'll be so many parents nodding at that point, Judd, that they have done something similar. Uh, yeah, we did that. We we decided to get rid of the Wi-Fi in the house, and our daughter just lost her mind. So she's done that speech for real? Uh, oh, yeah. She, well, she does that speech every day. I mean, we're <laughs> always debating with her how many hours of computer is okay, how many hours of iPhone is okay. And we don't know. I mean, some people say, well, this is how kids communicate now, and this is the future, and they need to to do it. This is their mall. And other people say, no, they have no attention span now. They have no imagination. They never just stare out the window and get ideas. So, uh, I, you know, we don't know exactly how to handle it. So uh, w what we do is we just change our positions every week and confuse her. Uh, Judd, we appreciate your time with us today. Just before you go, do you have some Oscar predictions that we could uh, that you could inform us with? What do you think? Well, what, well one thing I'm, I'm pretty sure of is that I didn't win. So you, if, you, if that's part of your betting, I did not win Best Picture. No? Uh, that's solid. That's solid, uh, solid advice. But I don't know. I think there's a lot of great movies this year. It's a shame that anyone has to lose because I always find it silly. Like, is Lincoln really better than a Moore? I mean, at some point, it's just, you know, eight or ten great movies. And on any given day, anybody could be Best Picture. Yeah, but that's, that not, a great, that's not a great ceremony, is it? Uh, that being said, uh, Beast of the Southern Wild. Let's go. Uh, Judd, we appreciate your time with us. Thank you very much indeed. All right. Take care. Thank you, Judd. Have a nice lunch. All right. You too. Bye-bye.